So um, we're going to keep this all about the film, all about the main girl and unlikable female characters because frankly that's what I'm here to promote and once again you should all buy a copy downstairs. Um, but I want to, um, really we're going to keep this as a two-way conversation but tell me, we were talking about this downstairs, when did you first see Jawbreaker? What did you think about it when you first saw it versus re-watching it for this? So, when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with like buying the interests, even though it was like, time unnecessary. Um, like DVDs did exist, streaming nearly existed. Like you could like illegally stream anything you wanted. I was like, I want to buy VHSs and just see what I find. Mm -hmm. And I found Jawbreaker once. I watched it, and I was very in my like Tumblr girl. Heather's mean girl era so it fit right in with that I also feel like you know the costume is so at some point then some point when I found it like 15 years ago and so on point now like I think it's a great film like it really holds up in so many ways like cameos from Marilyn Manson aside <laughs> yeah, the, the one thing that I deliberately blocked out of my memory of this film that I found so distasteful yeah. when watching it tonight it's like, oh yeah, this happened. Yeah. How did you find the film? Like, how, when did you first watch it? I probably was a teenager watching a lot of teen movies. I don't have an exact memory of it, but I do remember probably quite masochistically watching a lot of teen movies and being drawn to the mean girls because <laughs> I was severely bullied at school. So I was like, ooh, in these films, they all get their comeuppance. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the real life, Mean Girls don't get their comeuppance. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember re-watching it while I was researching the book, re-watching a lot of the, um, the your classic Mean Girl films, your Heathers, your Mean Girls, all the 80s stuff, and the 90s stuff in particular, which has its own brand of savagery that I really right. appreciated. And Courtney, played by Rose McGowan in the film, is, is so sociopathic and so violent in so many different ways like she's she's murderous like she doesn't care about killing a person mm -hmm. but she also has that mean girl <laughs> thing of i'm going to destroy you socially mm -hmm. uh and and i feel like it's a film that doesn't get screened that often doesn't get spoken about that much um but it's aside from the marilyn manson cameo has aged so wonderfully <laughs> <in that expression. laughs> no totally and i feel like i remember when I was like trying to find screen caps of it for my Tumblr and stuff like that. They were just so few and far between. Like, I remember a few so specifically, like when, um, I can't remember her name in the film anymore, but she's wearing her sunglasses, like leaning over the car when she's talking to the theater boyfriend. Like, there's a few moments that you could find on Tumblr, but that was it. Mm -hmm. And it feels like now it is kind of entering more of that like aesthetic, accepted lexicon. I mean, it looks like all the girlies dress like now, no? That's true. You literally couldn't distinguish this from Euphoria. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Like, so ahead, like so of the moment, but also, yeah, you'd look at something like that and think, oh, it's gonna look naff, like it's gonna look bad, we're gonna look back on it. Like, you know, like how we do Heather's kind of. It's not the same with fashion, like, mm. Heather's have bad clothes. <laughs> no! <laughs> 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 Veronica has all. great clothes, but the rest of them have bad clothes, and I will stand by that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I cannot accept this. This is where my life oh, okay. is. <laughs> this discussion is over if we disagree with this woman. But something that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to ask you about um, is while I was rewatching Jawbreaker today, was that like all of the mean girls in this kind of like era of teen girl films, and like well, all through cinema basically. A rich like mm -hmm. why do you think that's such an important archetype to associate them with wealth as well well because the rich girls can have the time to worry about everything <laughs> else don't they right you know they they live in these lavish houses everything is bestowed upon them but also everything is expected of them they're expected to be thin they're expected to be beautiful they're expected to be popular they're expected to only socialize with the rich good looking others in their in their high school mm -hmm. so it's like it's a very tenuous grasp on popularity and power that they have and i don't think they would have the time to be so aggressive and mean and <coughs> um concerned with power if they had to worry about where their tuition was coming from mm -hmm. where their lunch was coming from and i think you know we're very much in our eat the rich genre era right mm -hmm. now we love seeing the succession kids 
get emotionally destroyed. We love seeing everyone suffer on the white logos. We get a kick out of it. Mm. And I think there's a part of Mean Girls and Cinema being punished as well that comes back to that. It's like, let's see the rich, spoiled girls be punished at the end of the movie because how dare they do so little and whatever they do is very nasty with so much that they're given. This is so interesting as well though because like I definitely agree with you that there's an element of catharsis in you know seeing people get what's coming to <laughs> seeing like these girls get to mm. get what's get what's coming to but also I feel Jawbreak is quite unique in that like it follows Courtney quite closely as opposed to like Violet or whatever like she gets the most screen time mm. so at the end it's kind of like oh did she deserve that like she has a really nice hair band on and I just like, <laughs> <laughs> is she really that bad um and I feel like that's the reason why people are so drawn to mean girl characters mm. like also specifically Regina George right like I would literally pinpoint it as such that like Regina George specifically but obviously she has those roots in all of these characters including Courtney like paved the way for like the girl boss feminism like hyper mean hyper individualist feminism that is popular now mm -hmm. like do you think we've kind of all missed the point in rooting for these characters a bit <laughs> <laughs> well i think there's there, it's splintered off in two directions isn't it? because on the one hand there's that and then you can see it kind of once they grow up they become the chivroys mm -hmm. right chivroy was 100 percent of courtney in high you school think? yeah 100 wow don't you think no i feel like chivroy in my head was always like because she's a bit like dowdy and like has ginger hair. <laughs> like people, people aren't kind to girls like that in school. Really? I can 100 percent see Shiv strutting down a highway. She does also have like emotion. a lot of confidence for some yeah. for someone that like if you were bullied, you probably wouldn't be that. Just like I can take the whole car. Exactly. Yeah. She, she'd probably uh, bully people in her high school and tell them it's like, oh, my dad can buy your dad's company. Right, right, right. If yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. say anything mean to me. Yeah. yeah or yeah, like yeah, have yeah. the biggest house and the biggest pool parties mm -hmm. that she, you know, nobody would want to go to, but they'd have to go to just to right. see the inside of the house. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, that's a full backstory. <laughs> yeah. But uh, to go back to thing, um, I think it's been turned off into this kind of, you know, girl, they grow up and they grow up to be like the Sophia Marusos, the girl bosses. And then on the other hand, we have kind of more contemporary teen dramas and companies like Sex Education and Netflix, where it's like, we get several mean girls, but they have histories, they have personalities, they're using the mean girl elements as a persona, and they're, like, they learn from that as well, and they grow up and they gain empathy, or they gain um, sort of a sense of, you know, social consciousness with other people. They basically just learn to respect other people as well, slowly, but mm -hmm. they are given that time and that interiority. Whereas I think, you know, characters like Courtney, um, even Regina George kind of, you know, gets a happy ending. Mm -hmm. She does get, you know, this is not a spoiler, I don't think, but uh, she does get hit by a bus, but she survives mm -hmm. and she gets sort of a happy <laughs> ending and she learns from it. But there's Courtney, it's like, she's done. Yeah. And every other mean girl that you think of, including most of the ones in Heather's, mm -hmm. except Veronica, they're, like, they're done. Mm -hmm. They don't really get to come back from being that stock character. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also been an evolution of being us being, and the series and the movies being a bit kinder to the mean girl as well. Like she can change. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's like a good thing? Because I feel like one of the reasons these characters have such cult appeal and maybe find themselves being beloved by like marginalized groups in particular mm -hmm. like queer people or women or whatever is like a kind of projection like oh they have all they have the experience that i can have because i was constantly othered or like you know like oh yes. she was everything i can be etc 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 um or, or alternatively you can project the she got she got what was due to her in the end mm -hmm. you know she'll she's fucked basically sorry i don't know if it's fun. um <laughs> <laughs> That's wearing a jawbreaker. Maybe There's not a actually. Lot of <laughs> um, like, part of the allure of these girls knows that we project ourselves onto them. So mm -hmm. if they get more of a <laughs> well-rounded story, I don't know what I'm saying at this point, but I do kind of believe it. Um, does that kind of take that away a bit? Well, I think that two things can be true at once. You yeah. can sort of hate these characters that are designed to be hated, and at the same time have them be sort of a, a, an el have an element of wish fulfillment it's like oh i wish mm -hmm. you know i wish i was courtney instead of Fern, because you just get to 
strut around your high school, wherever that might be, in a different way. And if you have an experience of, you know, your education or your high school life as being afraid of it or not wanting to go or having to, you know, like put up with stuff while you're there, that anything outside of that is preferable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess the image that these characters project is always like they're so clear in who they are. Mm -hmm. Even if it's like a very, very good mask, and what like Jawbreaker and Heather shows us is that it's a mask, yeah. and it takes a lot of effort to put on mm -hmm. and to maintain down to the bit where they're talking about, oh, nobody can see us eat mm -hmm. because then it, it makes them think we're human, mm -hmm. and that's not the image that they <laughs> want to project. They don't want to be associated with anything human. Like, yeah, food is nice and you need it to live, but let's not let anyone think that we participate in that. I say, like, weirdly not problematic. You know, I mean, very problematic, but as in, I liked the food is nice, we need it to live, we like good food, but just not <laughs> like the weird social snobbery of it. But that's it, it doesn't yeah. like extend to actually being bad behavior, like unhealthy behavior. I mean, it's relatively unhealthy, but then show me a teen movie that isn't yeah. riddled with eating yeah, disorders, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At least yeah. they admit to liking food, that's true. At least they do consume human food. In <laughs> I was about to say, like, humans, I was like, <laughs> I don't think of yellow jackets. <laughs> but yeah, how do you think? It, can we talk about Courtney for a second? Because I do think she is, and I said this in the intro, she is particularly savage amongst the mean girls. Like, even we're watching this now, she feels really heartless. Whether she deserves the finale she gets, and you know, it's such an it's such an iconic image that's you know, it's Courtney Love. It's well now Olivia Rodrigo mm -hmm. as well, like that image of this girl kind of humiliated in slow motion by every single one of her peers. Um, but what do you think of her and this sort of canon of mean girls? I mean, yes, I think it is quite refreshing to see a mean girl character that seems to have like no regrets until the very final moment. Do you know what I mean? And like even then, it's like I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you got caught. It's quite obviously the latter. Um, and I think. Again, that's why like a lot of people are drawn to her as a character because she shows so many of the emotions that as like women we're not used to seeing. Like we're not used to seeing someone be so ruthless. I mean obviously a bit more now, but like in the canon of history and visual culture that's not something that's like hugely expected. Mm -hmm. And that yeah, it defo leads the way for even people like Shiv Roy, like making selfish decisions, doing things just because you want them to, like disregarding people around you or just not ways in which we're used to seeing women still um and i think it's important to have like equal representation for like really horrible people <laughs> as well as really nice people because otherwise we're putting like one gender into a box and saying like oh this is what like it can be nothing mm -hmm. else do you know what i mean um but I obviously also what's in her favor that she like looks great <laughs> it's clearly having like rose mcgall is clearly having a great time playing her like it does take the edge off a bit, I think. Do you? Yeah. I think it adds me, it adds an additional layer of edge to me. Mm -hmm. Because also, like, thinking back in the context of when this was made, this is 1999. Mm -hmm. Like, Rose McGowan has, uh, this is not her first film, but she's done mostly sort of independent cinema. She's done stuff with Greg Araki. She's done kind of like, you know, very indie films. And this is an indie film. But she has this sort of reputation already of being kind of, a weird bad girl you know she goes to your song dances and your festivals she's the talk of the town she's dating you know Marilyn Manson mm -hmm. at the time she brings him into this project as well there is something really edgy about her and the way that she play and she can play really kind on screen obviously I'm thinking about charmed here but when she's playing kind of these edgy really sharp tongued characters like here and her character in the doom generation by Greg Araki as well there's something really deadpan about her mm -hmm. delivery and she kind of really is good at playing dead behind the eyes. <laughs> in the, <laughs> she spoke a lot about being inspired by Jean Tierney's performance in Leave Her to Heaven, which is another kind of, you know, socio near sociopathic moment from classic Hollywood cinema. But I love the fact that she's unrepentant. She only cares about whatever is useful for her in any given moment. And it is really scary how good she is at playing the sad little girl. Mm -hmm. She's very good at kind of performing vulnerability when she needs to, at not just lying, but kind of lying and, you know, creating the worst possible nightmare for parents, for 
the investigator played by Pam Greer, for everyone around her, she'll find the thing that will hurt them the most mm -hmm. and will go for the jugular without really any consideration. Even for her buddies and her friends, she'll like also literally either kill them or throw them under the bus. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask anyone to describe their like school bully, that's how you describe them, right? <laughs> because you like still have the lens of like that 13, 14 year old person on your head where it's like, they are literally unrepentant. Like we know mm -hmm. they have a full, probably hard and joyful life when they leave school, but when you're in that space, that's the whole world. And I think that's what I love mm -hmm. about teen films and especially ones that like show the breadth of this is that it's confined to that world. It's like its own micro universe and the way people behave there is the way that they are because mm -hmm. that's what we see of them. Do you know what I mean? Yes, exactly. And that's also like we barely see any adults in this film, do we? We see Liz's yeah. parents yeah. and the teachers. The teachers are always goofy. Yeah. <laughs> and very strange. Yeah. And it's very it's very, very deliberate. Like the teachers are not figures of authority mm -hmm. at all. The only figure of authority here is Pam Greer's mm -hmm. investigator who kind of sees to the bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um but the parents are really there. We never see Courtney's parents no. at all. We just see her, you know, bring a dude home. Amazing, amazing circle thing. bed. Yes. Yeah. yeah of course, it. that's exactly what I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've always loved in teen movies how the parents, unless they're part of the story, and the whole thing is about the relationship between the teenagers and their parents and their home life, they're just not mm -hmm. part of the equation mm -hmm. because in school, they don't matter. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you could do is get your parent to yeah. come to your defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then exactly. you're just dead. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think? Did you Do you think your like opinion on Mean Girls changed writing your book? In, in yes. cinema, not in the world, but also in the world if you like that. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. There does seem to be kind of a Mean Girl renaissance right now with stuff that's going on in the world of gossip. but. Mm. Uh, it did actually. It did. It went from more of a it went from more of a camp appreciation to they look great. They have all the best singers. They're played by the most charismatic actresses. They're the juiciest roles. They're the ones we remember the most. Name me, you know. I mean, you know, what's the name of Amanda Seyfried's character? Don't know. But Regina George is the queen in Mean Girls. Mm -hmm. Same with Courtney in Jawbreaker. Same with well, everyone is named Heather and Heather. So that's kind of beside the point. But. Um, you remember these characters a lot more and while I was writing that chapter in particular and re-watching a lot of sex education where there's two mean girls both kind of mirror images of each other Maeve and Ruby um, I started to feel a lot more uh, tenderness towards mm -hmm. them I started you know you don't get given a lot of backstory for them but I noticed how that was changing mm -hmm. and you know even going back to the 80s if you go to something like pretty in pink there's a mean girl there with the fluffy blonde hair and the singers, and she's very, you know, sexually active and very aggressive towards the lead character, but she's in there for three minutes, mm -hmm. literally three minutes. She has a couple of lines and that's it, and you know that you're supposed to hate her. And then, you know, you go to something like this and then something like sex education, and there's this whole life and all these characters that you can connect with and kind of, you don't excuse their behavior, but you get it. Um, it's interesting because you like write a lot in the book about mean girls, about yeah, sexuality is like a lose this situation, they're expected mm. to be promiscuous. Or they expect, they're expected to be sexually attractive, but then a lambasted for being promiscuous. Yeah. It's interesting because we kind of see that both happen in Jawbreaker, as in we see Courtney have like her popsicle moment and it's mm. kind of like, not empowering, but you know what I mean, it like asserts her character as who she is. And then ultimately, someone's framed for the murder of Liz because she like liked to go fuck with old men or whatever. Mm. Um, do you think, what do you think about that representation and like why do you think that's so tied up in the mean girl trope? Well because it's the losers battle of young girls, especially teen girls, being sexualized by everyone around them but also at the same time being such shamed. Uh, if they ever show any interest or in sex or kind of start developing or exploring their sexuality. So it's like a constant you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, but also not damned if everyone else wants you mm -hmm. to. It doesn't make any sense, and we know where it comes from. It's a very complicated mess to untangle. And I think these films, I mean, obviously it doesn't help that all these characters are played by people in their 20s, like in their mid-20s. So <laughs> teenagers do not look like that. <laughs> uh, and they do not have those bodies. So it's like, you, you. these films also mess with our heads. Like I expected 
my classmates to look like 25 year old I think this really showed for me when I rewatched it because I was like, I yeah. thought everyone looked younger when I watched this before. Like, no, everyone looks like a big adult now. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes a huge difference when you're a teenager and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I don't look like that. <laughs> and I won't look like that for another seven years, mm -hmm. uh, if ever. <laughs> but there, I, I think it, these films kind of really, if you start empathizing with the main girl, the first way to empathize with them is kind of they're very often mistreated by usually men because they're mostly straight so they're usually kind of you know taken advantage of full-on sexually assaulted and they're and very often that's just dismissed that's very much like oh well that's part and parcel it's the hotness tax mm -hmm. if you're this kind of hot then you get to be everybody else's candy and that's really distressing if you think about it for a minute because you're like yeah they're very mean to everyone else especially other girls but then when you look at them for that lens they're mostly also just traded mm -hmm. between guys courtney is a rare exception because not only nothing kind of bad happens to her in that sense she's the one who is aggressively pursuing or using men including grown men mm -hmm. in the film fiction like, like setting up a rape scenario which is beyond messed up but also when we see, do see her hook up in an extended scene with the lollipop she's the one who is um you know not taken advantage of but she's the one who's dominated in the situation well i think that scene's also interesting because it's like she's almost enforcing the binary that you set out like that as in that you identify in these things like you have to be sexy just sexy enough to be like wanted but not sexual enough to have sex which is kind of exactly what that scene is like mm. she's teasing him they don't actually do anything because the doorbell goes it's like that's she's kind of an epitome in that scene of those things exactly that's exactly right and also there's an element of her kind of you know by forcing him to suck on the lollipop as funny as it is to watch it's also like yeah he's in the school dynamics mm. in any other movie he would be you know overpowering her in terms of like the where they stand in the social hierarchy but in this high school in this universe no one does that to Courtney Shea so it's like another way of exerting her her control over everyone around her and I think that's genuinely what she gets off on I don't think she's particularly interested in Dane the jock it's more like how can I humiliate Dane to make sure that he knows that I'm the one in charge in this room yeah totally do you think that that is like an element of mean girlness if you took that out being a mean girl, like being overtly sexual, do you think it would lose its essence? I'm thinking about like, obviously sex education, as you mm -hmm. said, that those two things, those two characters where you may do have sexuality tied up in them, but it's more complex. Also Maddie and Euphoria, like I feel mm -hmm. like it's a big example of this, someone that's like yes. overtly sexual, but then also has that vulnerability. Is that just like a core of being a mean girl? Because this whole other conversation now, like, a big euphoria discourse is that like even if adults they shouldn't be having sex on screen because teens are watching it and it's bad do you know what i mean yeah <laughs> i mean there's a whole it's a whole thorny subject of like you know what i mean teens will just watch anything i would watch anything mm -hmm. especially if someone told me i wasn't supposed to yeah, exactly skins I mean, anyone like <laughs> exactly and like you can't you can't it's impossible to prevent anything in the age of the internet um but the maddie and i think this is wrapped up again in kind of the whole sam levinson of it all who is a man who needs some therapy <laughs> but maddie they remember very distinctly her episode in the first season of euphoria she's learning how to perform sexuality mm -hmm. basically as a to do a lot of it informed by an online porn uh where she she's not thinking about herself and her own sexuality she's thinking about what would look sexy to the guys and then that validates her it's a lot with a lot of the characters in euphoria like cat as well yeah a lot of them go by that um sydney sweeney in season two mm -hmm. also very much so it's like yeah we need to look this way to validate to be validated yes. as opposed to because it's actually their essence and where it comes from exactly but then maddie has her friendships you know mm -hmm. her friendship with the other girls especially with sydney sweeney's character are very important and whether they're you know given the importance in the show or not the characters are played that way mm -hmm. and that is you know i'm not going to miss kind of her relationship with nate but that that is the crucial relationship in the show for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll probably never get season three at this rate anyway. No, so. no, I mean, <laughs> nobody should watch The Idol. Yeah. Oh, I did episode one. <laughs> it was very bad. But yeah, and you know, we talked about kind of the, the new main girls with sex education and euphoria, um, but we're, I'm interested in what you brought up kind of about the girl bossy mm -hmm. era as well. 
that picks up directly from these films and Mean Girls from 2004 as well. Where do you think Mean Girls go when they grow up? <laughs> oh, definitely. I think you're right. Like, it depends on the mean girl, right? Because there's always that, like, thought that if you're bullied, like, your bullies peaked in high school, no? Like, their life will never hit the highs that ours do as, like, mere losers that existed in the world of that. And I think there is a truth to that, you know? Like, I think if you're very popular in secondary school, you're always, like, pining for that, or, like, so mm. I'd like to believe I absolutely was not. Um, but I also believe des definitely they're the girls that are doing, like, MLM schemes. They're the girls that are, like, shilling you um, diet protein powder on Instagram, they're the girls that like have different businesses every week like Etsy side hustles, like mm -hmm. married like someone that they knew in school and like have a nice house. I mean their lives are probably fine, you know, like they're probably fine. But um I think it would be interesting to see if they ever like as in it'd be interesting to see a film that was like, yeah, like a mean girl ten years on or whatever. So like, did they ever reckon with themselves or not? Yeah, the one that really comes to mind is Rami Michelle's High School Reunion, yes. yes. where we do see Mean Girls 10 years yes. on, and as you said, they don't really lead very interesting lives, <laughs> which is, you know, the comforting semi-truth that we all grasp onto mm -hmm. if you did not have a very nice time in high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's just, you know, keep that dream alive. <laughs> exactly. None of them have fulfilling lives. No, no. <laughs> just stick with the Etsy side hustles. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested in, you know, I kind of hinted at it before, but I saw quite a lot of pieces go around, and I'm pretty sure I saw, and I heard an episode of the Polyester podcast about this as well, about kind of mean girl culture becoming mainstream pop culture as well, mm. which feels like a throwback to mm. this particular kind of teenage and 90s savagery. What do you think of that? Oh, 100%. Like, I feel like we're in a position to judge people more keenly than we ever have. So that episode of my podcast was specifically about this like TikTok thing that went viral, where it's like a girl was at a baseball game or a sports game filming herself for content and two girls behind were kind of like going, yeah, loser, no, like sticking their middle fingers up being like, yeah. Basically like mocking her for filming herself and it kind of set up this whole debate about like who was the mean girl? Oh, and then the original girl put it on the internet mm -hmm. and the girls in the back got docs, lost their jobs, like etc, etc, etc. And it started this whole debate online, like who is the mean girl in that situation? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where the culture is shifting to because like traditionally if we follow like the mean girls the jawbreaker trope we're meant to hate the girl that's filming herself because she's beautiful she's confident enough to film herself in public she's all of these things that a lot of people would dream of but then you're kind of like confronted with mean behavior from like people that would usually be on the receiving end of hers and it throws everything out of whack mm -hmm. but i do feel like it's more complicated but that will always look to like mean girls for like a confidence boost almost it's like there's a reason why regina went so large on like tumblr on twitter is like the theme of a million gifts and it's because mm -hmm. like we still aspire to that confidence in some way 